Hello and welcome to the Global View on this Wednesday. Well, as investors and markets await further US economic data, they're considering more Fed speak, with Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic saying there's no urgency to begin cutting rates. Inflation, he says, is going to come down relatively slowly in the next six months, which means that there's not going to be urgency for us to start a pull off of our restrictive stance. Well, financial markets are pricing in a 67% likelihood that the US interest rates will be cut as soon as March. The US 10-year Treasury yield is lower at 3.92% and a two-year sitting at 4.44%. Now, US new home starts, they've surged 18% in November to a more than one and a half year high. Meanwhile, on the global trade front, the EU will suspend tariffs it imposed on US imports in retaliation for US duty on EU steel and aluminium until March 2025. Well, the US dollar jumped against the yen after the Bank of Japan gave no sign that its ultra-loose monetary policy is set to end. But the greenback has weakened against most other major currencies. The Aussie was around 1% higher at uh, close to 67, well, we hit 67.7. In fact, uh, that's its highest level since late July. Let's take a view of fixed income in the face of slowing inflation and the prospect of lower interest rates. I caught up with Adam Whiteley, Head of Global Credit at Insight Investment. A lot of new information for sure over the last week or so. And as we look forward, we now see the Fed that is validating market pricing and expecting the next move to be a cut rather than a hike. We would agree with that narrative but we don't expect the first cuts to be coming through probably until the middle of next year. And as things stand, the market's probably got a bit carried away, expecting the first cut to maybe come as soon as March 2024. All right. Now, this, of course, still contingent on inflation, which is coming down, but still well above those target range. Um, what, what's your view on how inflation is tracking at the moment? The good news is that inflation continues to come back down towards central bank targets. But really, the the easy work's been done. And now the last mile is arguably going to be the most difficult. And that's because we've still got extremely strong labor markets. And for the real core components of inflation to durably come back down to central bank targets, you need wage pressure to reduce. And that's unlikely to really happen until you get some incremental slack in labor markets themselves. Uh, then, of course, we've got an interesting development right now, in fact, uh, given what's going on in the Red Sea with the prospect that uh, global trade could be disrupted. Certainly, we're seeing the impact on oil. Uh, these uh, events, I guess, um, not priced in, of course, but uh, what, uh, what potential for disruption are you seeing there in the, uh, in the broader effect? Sure. So the the concern here, of course, is what happens to oil prices. There's an awful lot of oil that is both produced in that region, but also a lot of cargo and a lot of oil that is moved through the region. And if you were to get an escalation in tensions there, oil prices going up, manufacturing and the service cycle being disrupted, that's going to complicate the picture for central bankers. And certainly in the shorter term, you'd expect that to have an inflationary impact. Now, it's not just what's going on there in you know, the Red Sea region that is potentially on the horizon for politics. Next year is extremely noisy when it comes to political cycles with nearly 2 billion people across the planet actually getting out there to go and vote. Now, uh, Adam, of course, recently we have seen both equities and bonds rally. Is that, uh, do, you, do you expect that that uh, correlation is likely to continue? Well, the everything rally certainly suits most people. And this correlation between risk free and risk assets has been one of the features of the last year or two. And that's really a change from what you would expect going back through history. And it's all about the inflation picture. So when you had inflation materially above central bank targets, you get this very high correlation because it's a one way path for policy. But as we get closer to central bank targets, you get much more symmetry in terms of the policy rate paths, and therefore there's a better chance of having that diversification between your risk-free government bonds, but against your more aggressive growth risk assets. All right, before we get a little further into portfolio positioning as such, um, 
once again, your view on where the global economy is tracking, in particular, I guess, with a focus on the states there with the prospect that interest rates will be cut. Um, are you of the view, though, that uh, there will be a soft landing? If so, um, just how many cuts can we expect? We would subscribe to the soft landing view as a central case, but we absolutely recognise there are many other scenarios that could be more detrimental to particularly the growth side of economies. And our confidence in that central case is certainly lower than we would like. But as a starting point, we need to reflect what is still a very strong position for both the corporate and the consumer sector. And that has allowed so far, particularly the US economy, that seems to be much less interest rate sensitive to navigate through these tighter periods of policy and hopefully keep growth on the positive side of zero whilst getting inflation back towards those central bank targets. So given as for a, cuts, sorry, sorry, go on. Yeah, as, as for cuts, you know, we're expecting probably three from the US uh, by the, this time next year. That's quite a bit less than markets are pricing. But the path from here does seem clear to us. It's more likely cuts than it is hikes. Yeah, OK. So anything more than three then would be something of a warning sign, I guess, that obviously the economy is deteriorating uh, to a, uh, a, a more than expected. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, what I think we've seen from the Fed speaker over the last month or so is that they're now more able to talk about both aspects of their mandate, one of which is inflation, one of which is employment. And with inflation closer to target, being able to think about maybe the negative impacts of their policy setting on what that may do for employment and by consequence, the growth cycle. Okay, Adam, so given that macro outlook, what's an appropriate allocation of fixed income? How defensive do you need to be, do you think? Well, fixed income is really rediscovering its asset allocation role. And we've been seeing a huge amount of interest from our investor base and prospects and really at a level that we've not seen for over a decade. And that speaks to the starting point where the income has been put back in fixed income. And you know, if you like being paid to be impatient. So today there's yield available back in government bonds and corporate bonds in a level we've not seen for 15 years. So that's the income box ticked. But if you look forward and you do expect a world of lower rates, there's also the potential for positive total returns coming from fixed income. And if you like, given the starting point, almost an asymmetry in terms of the return profile that you could expect from fixed income. All right, and with the prospect perhaps of uh, further uncertainty, is that gonna lead to volatility? How do you play that? Well, volatility, we'd certainly expect to continue. And when we think about the ongoing economic policy or indeed the political risks, those are all reasons to believe that volatility will endure in markets. Right now, arguably, you're in a more complacent zone, but we don't think that will persist. And if we think about the opportunity that volatility creates, that's the ideal environment for active management, where we can look to take advantage of the dislocations that this uncertain world will present. I see you point out that those credit, uh, those credit spread valuations are sitting below their long-term averages. Yeah, and, and if we focus in on the credit spread component, so the compensation for taking company default risk, they are below their long-run averages. And really, at these valuations, the market's ascribing a very high probability to the soft landing. And as we touched on earlier, that is the central case. But from here, it's hard to argue in isolation there's compelling value from credit spreads. But what is compelling is the combination of credit spread plus government bond yield, giving you the all-in yield from corporate bonds and the income and the total return that that may generate. So, so what is an appropriate balance when you consider both credit and also those government bonds? Well, at the moment, we'd look for having some interest rate sensitivity but not taking an enormous amount of default risk. And where that leads us to is investment grade, where on average it's a single A rating and a historic context, that's meant you haven't really need to worry about company level defaults. That's a problem for high yield. So having the interest rate component along with the credit spread and not having to worry about defaults in the economic outlook, we think is a nice balance to have for the current climate. And what do you need to consider in terms of duration? 
But in terms of duration, obviously, it's, it's a choice for the individual investor and their willingness, ability to take risks, their broader asset allocation. But if we're right in our view that government bond yields are either at fair value or likely lower from here, you'll want to have a little bit more interest rate sensitivity, but also being cognizant that you may get performance that varies across different parts of the yield curve. So the most movement is likely to happen in shorter dated government and corporate bonds as the cuts come through. The long dated elements of government bond markets have got some different drivers, particularly around budget deficits and the amount that the Treasury in the US and other similar governments and central banks need to issue to fund their deficits in the years to come. And Adam, a lot of chatter recently as to whether the 60-40 portfolio is dead. What's your view? I'm not sure it's dead, but I would certainly think that people have had a very eye-opening experience over the last two years, and they're looking quite naturally for other sources of diversification. You know, so maybe whether it's you know looking for alternative types of risk premia, having a slightly more dynamic approach to changing the 60-40 weights, you know, that's certainly on investors' minds. But the complementary nature of having bonds next to equities, I think, will continue for many investors. All right, that's Adam Wiley at Global Credit at Insight Investment. Let's uh, just a quick check of where we're expected to open. As you can see, SPY futures up around half a percent. Uh, that's after we saw a broad rally in global markets overnight. Stay with us. The open is just a couple of minutes away.